John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Henry Grant, Johnny. You read your morning paper yet? I'm on page four in my second donut. Well, turn back to page one. There's a picture there of Mrs. Frank Loring. Oh, I read it. Enoch Arden divorce decree. Husband missing seven years. New York court declared him legally dead. So? So we had him insured for a quarter of a million. And this court decision means you'll have to pay off? Within ten days. Something make you think Loring isn't as dead as he ought to be? It's a possibility. I had a phone call a little while ago from a woman up in Boston. She saw the item, too. What's her connection? She's a nurse. Ten years ago, when we issued the Loring policy, she was working for the physician who examined him. Now, her story may not mean anything, but, well, I asked her to take the first plane she could get and come in for a talk. She uh, should be here by uh, 11 o'clock. I'll grab a cab and come right over. John Lund in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Hemispheric Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Enoch Arden matter. Expense account item one, 50 cents, cab fare to your home office, where Henry Grant provided me with a complete file of previous investigations and police reports covering the disappearance of Frank Loring. I was about halfway through them when Grant came in with an attractive woman in her early 30s. Johnny, this is Miss Ruth Boulogne, the young lady I told you about. How do you do? Miss Boulogne, this is Johnny Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar's an investigator, Miss Boulogne. Now, I want you to tell him exactly what you told me on the phone this morning and, well, anything else you may have thought of on the way down here. Well, I don't really know whether I have anything to tell. You worked for the doctor who examined Loring when his policy was issued? Yes, Dr. Felton. That was in New York. I'd just gotten out of training. It was my first job. I was only there three months, then I went into the Army during the war. Mm-hmm. And since the war, I've worked in Boston, the Haywood Clinic. I, well, I, I feel sort of foolish telling you all this. I'm probably wrong. But she thinks she saw Loring in Boston, Johnny. When? Well, about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago yesterday. Where? At the clinic. Look, really, I'm not sure about... You're not hurting this. anybody, Miss Boulogne. Suppose you just tell us, and we'll take it from there. Well, as I said, it, it was two weeks ago. A man came to the clinic. He wanted to be vaccinated. Did he give his name? Yes, but it wasn't Frank Loring. He gave the name of Michael Walsh. I thought he looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. What was the reason for the vaccination? He needed an international certificate of vaccination. It's required by law for anybody going abroad. Oh, he was leaving the country. Well, I guess so. He wanted the certificate. I administered the vaccine. He came back five days later, and the doctor entered the result on his card and signed it. That's all I know. What made you connect this Michael Walsh with Frank Loring? I really don't know. I didn't until this morning. I remembered thinking I'd seen him before, and then when I saw that story this morning about Mrs. Loring, the name just came into my mind. You'd only seen Loring once, ten years ago? Yes, but as I said, it was my first job, and I... I was impressed at the time, having him for a patient. Why impressed? Well, I knew he was an actor. I'd seen a couple of shows he was in, read his name in columns, things like that. Did this Michael Walsh look like Frank Loring, as you remembered him? No, he didn't. I I can't explain it. Well, it seemed worth a try, anyhow, John. Wait a minute, Grant. Let's not chuck it out so easily. I've been reading this file on Loring... Played a lot of character roles. Expert on dialects and makeup. A man like that could change his appearance very easily. Something about him, the way he moved, the tone of his voice. Something registered with this girl. He'd have recognized her, too, when he went to the clinic. She was impressed with him. She had a reason to remember. He didn't. I, I feel a little foolish. And I feel a little curious. How about you, Grant? I've been curious all morning. So curious, I checked the steamship and airline. And? And a man named Michael Walsh sailed on the SS Castillo six days ago. She runs between Boston and Santiago, Chile. You know when she reaches the Panama Canal? Yeah, day after tomorrow. 
That's plenty of time for you to get down there by air. Yeah, with enough to spare for a stop over in New York and a chat with Mrs. Loring. <laughs> Expense account item two, $11.30. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut and the Greenwich Village section of New York, where Mrs. Frank Loring was living in a bohemian fashion. It was evening and the party was in full swing when I arrived. The apartment door was wide open, so I just walked in. Somebody shoved a glass into my hand like they used to do it at the local movie houses on dish night. Wow. You must be Linda's boyfriend. Oh, must I? I knew it the minute I saw you. She always goes for the same type. Musician, aren't you? They always are. What do you play? Ring Olivio and double on Parcheesi. <laughs> oh, a funny one, eh? Well, Linda said when you got here to tell you the benefit is going to run late, so make yourself comfy and wait. She won't be here until 12. I'm Freddy. You must be a poet. How did you know? I'm psychic. Now, what's the party for? Oh, Marsha's celebrating. She's going to get a quarter of a million dollars. Just because her husband, Frank, disappeared. She ought to be happy enough just to be rid of him. Don't be so bitter, lad. It'll throw your rhymes out of meter. I helped her get over him. I helped her. Anytime she wanted anything, all she had to do was call little Freddy. Now she's getting all that money and she'll just run out. Oh, she wouldn't do that to you, would she? Oh, no. That's how much you know about women. <laughs> she's going to Chile, South America. Oh, now that's an interesting bit of information, Freddy. She thinks I don't know about it. The airline called to confirm her reservation while she was out shopping this afternoon. Uh, which one of those lovely ladies uh, is Marsha Loring? Those? <laughs> she doesn't look like any of them. Marsha's out in the kitchen fixing sandwiches. She needn't think she'll get any help from me. Oh, maybe I can lend a hand. Listen, mister, you've got a girl coming. Oh, oh sure, Linda. Well, uh, she told me to give Marsha a message. Uh, besides, you don't want to talk to me. Interferes with your brooding. I'll see you later, Frank. <laughs> well, hello, come in. I'm making sandwiches for the starving multitude. I know. I came in to help. How are you on opening bottles? Champagne. But for those peasants, beer. It's it's right there. They open us on the hook. Oh, we're in business. Hey, what are you, a party crasher, or did you come with one of the girls? A crasher? Oh, well, the breed is improving. We uh, both know some of the same people, though. Like who? Who's been hiding you from me? Fellow up in Boston. I don't know anyone in Boston. Not even Michael Walsh? Get out of here. Now listen, Mrs. Loring. I said get I... out. You weren't invited here. You don't belong here, so... What is it, Marsha? What happened? What did he do? Keep your rompers on, Shakespeare. I told you not to bother her. You... You music... Look out, Freddy! came out of it lying on the cold stone of a basement areaway. And then I went in search of a diner a telegraph office. Expense account item three, 80 cents for breakfast and aspirin. Item four, $1.20 for a telegram advising that payment of the Loring claim be delayed until my investigation was completed. Item five, $7.60, cab fare to the international airport. And item six, $415, plane fare and incidentals to the city of Colon, Panama Canal Zone. As usual, it was raining in Colon. The SS Castillo had reached port slightly ahead of schedule. I was waiting to go through the locks when I made my way aboard. It was almost midnight. I located the name of Michael Walsh on the passenger list posted in the lounge and then made my way to the inside cabins on B-deck. I knocked on the door of cabin B-64. There was no answer. May I help you, senor? You the cabin steward? Si. I'm looking for the passenger who occupies this cabin. Oh, senor Walsh is not here. He's gone ashore. In this downpour? Si. Look, here's five bucks. All you have to do for it is to bring me the biggest towel you can find and... Open this cabin so I can wait inside. Gosh, yes, senor. But if you are waiting for senor Walsh, he will not be back. Why not? He's booked through to Santiago. When he went ashore an hour ago, he took his baggage with him. I helped him with it. 
You know where he went? No, senor. He was most anxious to get ashore as soon as our lines were fast. I see. Ship's wireless take any kind of cablegram for him in the past 24 hours? See, si, see, si, I delivered one to him in the middle of last night. He was most urgent, I think. He seemed most concerned. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Thanks. I knew that Frank Loring, alias Michael Walsh, wasn't going to be easy to find. Away from the ship, he was likely to have a third name. And since he was an expert with dialects, there was every chance he'd adopt a different nationality. I thought about it as I made my way through the narrow, rain-swept streets. I seemed to be the only man without shelter in all of Panama. But I wasn't. Do you have a match, senor? Huh? Oh, I could hardly see you. Yeah, yeah, I got a match. I doubt it will light in this rain. Uh, you don't appreciate the rain, senor? In the rain, I always get what I want. The turistas, they never refuse Jose. Hey, that isn't a cigarette in your hand. No, senor. It is a gun. You join me in the doorway, no? Well, I'd rather die than say no. Now, if the senor has some little thing he wishes to give Jose for a gift... Jose will be most grateful. I don't have much cash, but this wristwatch is worth a couple of hundred. Oh, see. Oh, that's a very nice one. I will like that. He bent his head slightly to look at the watch, and his gun hand dipped automatically. I brought my hands up to undo the watch strap, stepped quickly to the side, and let Jose have a left in the solar plexus. Now, now, drop it. Very well, senor. If you insist. Uh, that's better. You are... You are going to turn me over to the police, senor? Well, that depends. Oh, senor. The jail here is very bad. Jose does not like it. I tell you what. You help me and I'll help you. What kind of help does the senor need? Suppose the police or somebody were after me. Suppose I had to get out of here without using my passport. How would I do it? From Colón? There is no way, senor. Too many Americano officers... There must be some way out. Thirty miles down the coast is Puerto Bello, senor. It was once the hiding place for pirates. In Puerto Bello is a cafe called the Geisha Girl. The Geisha Girl? Si. And the proprietor is senor Kamamoto in Japanese. <laughs> he is very good at making people disappear, senor. star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account item seven, twenty dollars, flat rate. To the native taxi that slithered its way down the miserable, muddy road to Porto Bello, Caribbean stronghold of the old time pirates. It was a port of intrigue, an international black hole, a Western Hemisphere counterpart of Shanghai, or Calcutta, or Suez. And at the bottom of the hole was the Geisha Girl Cafe. Uh, you look lonesome, mate. Maybe it's because I want to be. I don't know you, and you don't know me. Let's keep it that way. Now, that ain't no way to be. Especially here in Portobello, where we're all friendly, like. Uh, you looking for Kamamoto? What are you, a cop? Well, I've been a lot of things, Governor. Never a cop. What's the matter? Start on a little trip and forget your passport? Let's say I lost it. What are you doing? Running a private embassy? Yeah, I'm sort of a missionary for people in trouble. You look like you're in trouble. I'll talk to Kamamoto about that. Where is he? Try the storeroom back there. Uh, it ought to be worth the price of a drink, eh? Thanks. Here, drown yourself. It's oh, nice of you, Governor.
Come, Mora. Ow. Hey. Anybody in here? Oh, matches. Two in a room filled with packing cases and lit by a feeble candle. Two men were seated on a couple of small barrels. One of them was the Cockney who had spoken to me in the bar. The other was a Japanese. Are you feeling uh, better, Mr. Dara? How... How did you know my name? Oh, from your uh, American uh, driver's license? Is that all they had on him? Oh, well, uh, there was some money which I uh, would find most useful. Oh, you were carrying the exact amount required to pay for your uh, passage, Mr. Dow. Over a thousand dollars? That's pretty high fare. I, uh, I am a terrible man. My rates are based upon uh, what my passengers can afford to pay. An unscheduled uh, ship line is expensive to operate. Uh, uh, so you will be taken aboard the uh, Kiramatsu uh, shortly. You will sail at uh, 4 a.m. For where? You will be put ashore somewhere in uh, South America. Venezuela, possibly, or Brazil. I'm not your only passenger. Oh, oh no. No, you are not. Uh... Well, uh, how about uh, untying me, as long as we're friends? Well, uh, are you uh, will be untied when you reach your uh, destination? Oh, now, wait a minute. I can see the point here where somebody might give you away, but why aboard ship? Well, uh, uh, fugitives from the law are uh, a risky cargo, Mr. Dara. The uh, South American nations are rather uh, thorough about their coastal patrol. So, uh, if you are tied up, we can make certain you are, you are not caught. What do you mean, Kamamoto? Well, simply that you are, you are hot cargo, Mr. Dara. And the only way to carry hot cargo is to be certain that you can uh, uh, dispose of it in an uh, emergency. Uh, <laughs> If we are challenged by a patrol vessel, uh, you'll be uh, weighted down and uh, thrown overboard. It was dark when they carried me aboard and left me still trussed in the deck cabin. Then the Kira Matsu pitched and rolled her way into the open sea. I knew that Loring was on board someplace, and I knew something else. Kamamoto had lied to the Cockney about what he'd found when he searched me. He had more than a driver's license. He had my insurance company credentials and my passport. Then the door opened and I got something else to think about. Buenos dias, Senor Dollar. Jose, how did you get here? <laughs> After you left me, I ran into another Americano with no race watch but much money. <laughs> he was kind to me. He gave me money to leave the country when I told him about the bad jails. Well, how come Kamamoto is letting you run loose? Why, <laughs> you are the only one who is tied up, senor. I do not think they intend for you to finish the trip. Hmm. Uh, how many other passengers are there? Besides us, three. A man and a woman came just before we sailed. That's two. Who's the other one? A man, a man with a white suit and a hat. A Cockney accent? What is that? Sounded like an Englishman? Oh, yes. He is English. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. How many in the crew? Kamamoto and five seamen. It is a very small boat. Yeah, yeah, I can feel that. Look, Jose, I gave you a break with the police. How about giving me one? I'm a businessman, senor. No sentiment. A thousand dollars. Guaranteed by an American insurance company. If you cut these ropes and lend me your gun. Cash, senor. No credit. Too much book. I haven't got any cash. Kamamoto took it all. Too bad. Maybe next time. There isn't going to be any next time for me. Ever buy a sweepstake ticket? See? Si. Well, then take a chance on me. Come on. How about it? All right. But when is the time for the drawing? To see if my ticket wins. As soon as you get these ropes off. But let's do it now. This tub may get to my stop any minute. <laughs> Jose cut the ropes and gave me his gun. There was an oil slicker hanging behind the cabin door, and I slipped it on for cover. 
The crew on deck was too busy to be counting noses in the storm. I edged my way forward to the main cabin, grasped the door handle, and crashed in. Dollar! Now, let's not get jumpy, anybody. I'm wet and I'm mad and I've been pushed about as far as I go. Well, good for you, Governor. Glad to see you up and about. You can drop the accent, Loring. And stop flexing your fingernails, Freddy. Now, what's the matter, Marcia? You get too nervous to stay home and fix sandwiches? I didn't have to stay. My lawyers can collect for me. Now, what? Loring looks pretty alive to me, even with that cockney accent. I'm more alive than you're going to be. Don't be a fool, Loring. You're more of a clay pigeon than I am. You've been practicing for the part for seven years. What are you talking about? You think you were going to get to spend any of that insurance money? You think I'm not? Ask Freddy. How about it, Freddy? I don't know anything. I just came with Marsha because she asked me to. Freddy's a nice boy, Loring. He writes poetry. And he'll do anything Marsha asks him to. Won't you, Freddy? What are you trying to do? Wait a minute. I want to hear this. Yeah, you ought to. Before your hearing stops altogether. Maybe you've been dead for seven years, but your widow hasn't been putting flowers on your tombstone. You stop talking about Marsha. You see, Loring? Freddy gets mad when I talk about Marsha. Freddy loves Marsha, don't you, Freddy? Yes. You ever take a look at his eyes, Loring? If Marsha said the word, he'd put a knife in you in a minute. Think it over, mister. Michael Walsh turns up dead in South America, and Mrs. Frank Loring and friend Freddy go back to Greenwich Village with a quarter of a million bucks. Only this time, they'd have nothing to worry about. Don't listen to him, Frank. Why not, Angel? He sounds like a pretty smart guy. We've waited seven years for this. Do you think I'd have anything to do with this little idiot? I've used him, that's all. Marsha. You see, Freddy? She'll get rid of you, too, after a while. There'll always be somebody else coming along to open the beer bottles. I was kind of wondering how Freddy got in on this little trip. I was wondering why we kept something between ourselves for seven years, and then you spill it to him. I was frightened, Frank. I knew Dollar was after you. That's why I wired you. I couldn't come down here alone until I was sure we'd be together. We'll be together, and we'll stay together until the money comes. Then maybe I'll have some ideas of my own. Give up, Loring. You're never going to get that money. Yes, I am, Dollar. Kamamoto's standing right behind you, the curtain between this cabin and the next one. Oh, don't uh, turn, Mr. Dollar. Now, let me have that gun, Dollar. All right, Kamamoto. Now, let's get rid of him. Oh, of course, Mr. Dollar. Why, Kamamoto? Why don't we bargain a little first? I'm afraid you are not in a uh, bargaining position. How much is he going to give you for dropping me? You'll get five grand, Dollar. Oh, you're dealing with a real cheapskate, Kamamoto. I'm worth more than that. I could shut you up right here. Please, you... Mr. Loring. Uh, let the gentleman speak. Now, do not use that gun unless I see so. This is my ship. You took my credentials before, Kamamoto. You know who I am. Yes. How much did Loring tell you he was going to collect? He's stalling, Kamamoto. Get rid of it. I warned you, Mr. Loring. I will decide who leaves the ship, and when, and how. Suppose you tell me the amount of the policy, Mr. Dollar. A quarter of a million dollars. He's lying. It's only 25000 Is it, Loring? i tell you what I'll do then, Kamamoto. Put us both ashore back in the canal zone where I can get him into the hands of American authorities, and my company will pay you $25,000. And I'll make it $50,000, Kamamoto. $50,000. I bet sixty. Do I hear seventy? Come on, Loring. Bid. I can go the whole quarter million. Won't cost my company any more either way. I'll kill you, Dollar. Oh, no. <laughs> Loring and Kamamoto fired at the same time. Both of them were hit, but only Kamamoto went down. Loring turned to Marsha. You wanted him. You can go together. Marsha! Marsha! All right, Dollar. That ends everything. Now I'm around to you, for sure. Oh, I wouldn't count on it, Loring. This time, I've got a friend in the doorway. What he says you... is true, senor. Senor Kamamoto was no longer using his gun, so I took it. Besides, you have only one bullet left. I have five. You kill Mr. Dollar, and I will have to kill you. You're cooked, Loring. Your wife's dead. You couldn't even get the money if you could get away. All right. Here. You can have it. Come on, hit me in the side. It hurts. Maybe I can patch it up a little. I'd better just rip your shirt. I loved her. She always wanted things more than an actor could give her. Whose idea was it? Hers. I hid out like a dog. She sneaked up to Boston to see me. Maybe once every six months after the first year. 
The rest of the time I was without her. I guess she wasn't lonely. Yeah. Some women never are. And that about finished it. Expense account, item eight, $60, miscellaneous expenses. Expense account, item nine, $1,000 as promised to Jose. Item 10, $421.80, plane fare and incidental expenses from Colon, Panama Canal Zone, back to Hartford. Total expenses, $1,879.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Joel Murcott with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Jeanette Nolan, Sidney Miller, Mary Jane Croft, Elliot Reed, John McIntyre, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Charles Lyon, Inviting you to join us again next week at the same time when, from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.